welcome everybody. We wanted to go ahead and get started. And thank you all for being here on this sunny afternoon. There's a lot of other places you could be, whether it's out in the office or taking a few minutes out in the sun. And it's nice to see some familiar faces in the audience as well. Um, I've been on, my name is Benin Gatzert, and the, my co-panelists will introduce themselves in a minute. But I just wanted to mention how the Authentic Relationships panel got started. Um, we were, a couple of us, Emma and I, were approached by the, on the organizing committee, and they wanted to do something on mentoring. And I've been on campus 33 years, 28 on staff. I'm one of those people who came here for undergrad and never left, one of those people that Carol asked about this morning. Um, and I've been really lucky that I've had some amazing mentoring experiences here, whether it's a handful of lunches with somebody who I really admired um, to somebody who's been a mentor since I was a student and I still work with. So I've seen her almost every day for 30 years. Um, so it's really amazing the wealth of experience that we have with people here on campus. I've also been a formal mentor in the BSA mentorship program, which um, they're just starting to release information about next year. And hopefully, will you do a plug at the end, Emma? OK, that would be great. Um, and what we wanted to do is we were thinking about relationship mentoring is focus more on the relationship part. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. It's possible to have a really productive mentoring experience without really developing an authentic relationship. But as we've been talking, we really feel that nurturing that relationship, having authentic conversations can really deepen the experience. So let me turn it over for more introductions. My name is Rosalie Janitska Fanchel, and um, I'll be on part of this panel because I worked with Benet this past year during the BSA mentorship program. Benet was my mentor, so I'll be sharing a little bit about that experience. I've been on campus since 2008. I've worked both at UC Berkeley and at UC San Diego, and then had a stint in Australia and came back to campus um, about four years ago. Oh, and um, I work. Oh, is it on? Okay, <laughs> so apologies if I need to speak a little. Um, I guess I currently am the program manager at the Berkeley Food Institute here on campus. I'm Emma Strong. I work for the fall program for freshmen. I'm an academic advisor there. I've been on campus for about three years total. Um, and my mentorship experience, I've had a lot of um, sort of informal mentorship that has kind of developed over time. And I'll be talking a little bit more about what that might look like, just an so organic mentoring experience that sort of occurs through the course of your life at work. Um, I've also participated in the BSA mentorship program as a mentee, and I'm on the committee that helps um, with planning and implementing the BSA mentorship program. Um, so that's my experience with mentorship. We've had a lot of fun getting ready for this. We spent a lot of coffees at 1951 on Channing. Um, <laughs> we did some interviews, looked at the literature, and then have been having a lot of soulful discussions. So we try are trying to bring other people's perspectives and voices in the room as well as those of ours today. So what we're going to do is, um, as we mentioned, we've set it up more so that we can do just tell a few stories about our different experiences. And Emma's going to wrap that up with some of the themes that we found during the interviews. Um, we have a couple times where we're going to do some small group discussions, pair you up, let you explore your own experiences, um, and do a little goal setting. And then um, being me, I'm a heart person, but I'm only a, also a head person, so we came up with found of some things in the literature, a mentorship relationship cycle. Um, so it looks at the cycle of the relationship within the mentoring context. And then we've compiled some tips for mentees and mentors. So that's what we have planned today. And if you have questions, you can raise your hand with the panel. And then we just need to yeah, show this. There is a lot of noise outside, and so if you guys can speak up. OK, I wonder if we actually should do the this part up here. People are having a hard time. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Manet. 
Um, so yeah, we did want to just start off with um, what we're calling some case studies. Um, so first, I'm, we're going to talk a little bit with um, Benet and Rosalie about their experience um, in their mentorship. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal experience as well. Um, so to start out, for those of you who aren't aware, the BSA mentorship program is a formal mentorship program on campus um, that's uh, organized through the Berkeley Staff Assembly. And if you have questions about that, um, definitely feel free to ask me at the end or send me an email later, but that's um, the mentoring context here. Um, so Rosalie, um, how did your mentoring relationship start and what were you looking for going into that? Um, and how did you decide which mentors might be a good fit for you? Sure. So um, like I said, I started working at UC Berkeley in 2008, which was, I think, actually the first year of the BSA mentorship program. And it kind of piqued my curiosity at the time I was coming off of 15 years in the nonprofit world. So it was my first time working in the UC context. And I thought, oh, this is something I'll want to do at some point. And then the time was right to do it um, this last cycle. And so I had the very unusual goal that I was actually trying to figure out how to advance within my own department, which is something that can be quite challenging to do within the UC structure. And I will say up front that I didn't actually succeed necessarily in achieving that goal, but I achieved a lot of other things in the process of the mentorship program. But I had started out with a couple of very specific goals in mind. And in the process of um, the way the program structures is those, this kind of um, the first, I think, four weeks of the program, you do informational interviews with potential mentors. I think there was 52 participants in the program this year, so there's uh, the same number of mentors and mentees. And I actually did inter interviews with seven potential mentors. At the beginning, there's kind of a, a list where you get everyone's CV, and you're looking on paper who you think might be good matches, and I chose, I think, four people during that process, and then one led to another, led to another. So... Um, I was looking for someone that had um, both a similar skill match to me in the kind of work I do, but was doing it in a more advanced place in the university. Um, I pride myself in being a highly skilled generalist, meaning I can do I, I do a job where there's a lot of different types of tasks, and I really like doing that kind of work and was really excited to hear the stories of other people that did similar work on campus. So that was one element. Um, the other element that I kind of didn't realize until I started doing the interviews is that I was looking for someone where we had cultural and kind of personality overlaps. And Benet and I are both in Lavender Cal. Um, we both identify as queer women on campus. Campus and that ended up being one of the pieces where I thought I would have a lot to learn and was excited about that. Also, it just when we, Vinay was the last person that I interviewed. <laughs> and by that point, I was like, oh, yeah, I have this down. I know what my goals are. And I have it had kind of come closer and closer to seeing what I was looking for. It was just like such an obvious match in terms of um, just like a similar way of communicating. And yeah, um, there she was, someone who'd been on campus 33 years doing a generalist, amazing position at a pretty high level. Thank you. Um, so another question we talked about um, was, how did you two build and foster trust in your relationship, and what helped you build trust together? So Rosalie, you can answer. Yeah. Um, I would say that both of us, just personality-wise, are folks that tend to be very open and warm, so it kind of matches well for this kind of relationship. I will say actually the, um, the first person I interviewed who would have been a terrific match was someone who I was the most completely personality different from and the most different life experience from. And in some ways I have thought about whether that actually would have been the best match in terms of to challenge what I'm comfortable with and expose myself to a part of campus that was completely different and learn a whole different set of skills. So I put that out there as another way to think about these things, but ultimately I'm very glad <laughs> that I ended up, like this, this was the right match to me, but I can see it kind of going either way as being very useful depending upon what skills you need to develop. Um, so I would say that, yeah, we just set it up with the structure that we would meet once a month um, for an hour, and we usually did it at a coffee shop, so it was outside of either of our offices, and we just both, from the beginning, I think were very, just open and, and developed, um, just kind of put on the table right from the beginning that we were equal participants in this process and that it would be a co-learning process. 
Yeah, and that theme of being equal participants, whether you're the mentee or the mentor, and learning together is something that we're definitely going to elaborate a little bit more on later. Um, I think that's really important. Um, so last question for you, Rosalie. Um, what are some of the things that Binet did specifically to help you think about your goals, and how did you work together to reflect on your goals and understand your goals? Sure. So like I said, I came in with two kind of very challenging but specific goals. And I think it's totally normal and natural over the course of a structured mentorship program that those goals would change. This is a year-long program. And about halfway through the program, it became really clear that, that neither of those initial goals were actually going to be easy to accomplish. But um, I think think that we did a combination of like setting times that's like, okay, here's a point that we're going to re-look at goals. Does it make sense to continue with these? If not, what are other goals? And so in between, like having those kind of times in the future that we know that we would be checking in about them was very helpful. And I've now already forgotten the other few questions. <laughs> <laughs> Remind um, me. Um, what were some things that you guys did to work together, understand, reflect? I know you talked about sure. like, um, like mirroring back, yeah. different things of feedback. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so Benet is, um, and I think it comes from her incredible work that she does at University Health Services and just her own development as a facilitator and a strategic thinker. Is she has an incredible ability to like listen very, very deeply to what I was bringing to the table and kind of reflecting back kind of wisdom bites that were either just like a nice condensing of what what I was bringing forth or experiences from her own life, which I found very useful. I don't think that every mentor needs to be like so personal about their own life as much as that she was able to relate to what I was saying and reflect back um, pieces that might be very helpful. As well, I'd also say that Benet introduced me to um, several other people on campus around specific things I was trying to resolve, like, oh, here would be a great person to talk to. So having a mentor who has such a broad network from her own work was incredibly helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so then I, my last question um, regarding this mentorship relationship is for Benet. Um, so Benet, you and I discussed at different points at, while planning this presentation and figuring out what other people might be interested in hearing, um, the fact that sometimes mentors can feel a little bit insecure going into that role and wondering like, do I have enough to bring to the table to be a mentor? Like, what if I am not able to um, help my mentee the way that they want me to? So um, can you talk a little bit about if you had any insecurities going into this relationship as Rosalie's mentor and how did you approach those insecurities or kind of work through that? So I vividly remember the day that we had our informational interview and Rosalie mentioned her two goals and I went, I really like this person and I'm really not sure I can help her. <laughs> and so I remember saying that I really think I'm probably not the best fit for each individual goal that you have, but I'm willing to support you around both. So if that's of interest to you. Um, the way I tried to on a kind of daily basis of when we were together manage my insecurities was one just the commitment to be present so that that's part of what helped me kind of continue to connect and reconnect and and listen deeply um, a willingness to be vulnerable and share some of my failures or challenges as well as successes um, not trying to make it about me because it's always about Rosalie but when, if I thought there was something that <laughs> well I have some family who kind of make it about them so <laughs> I just want to make a difference. Um, and then um, one of the things an early mentor taught me is the value of being willing to talk about life outside of work as well as work. And I really lay left that to Rosalie to decide if she wanted to go into that territory. But it's something that when I'm doing the informational interviews, I'm, you know, I say that I'm willing to kind of go across that area. Um, just because I had one person, a former Cal professor, who really talked about, especially for women in mentoring, having somebody who's willing to talk about work and life can be really powerful. So actually, it's my turn to turn the table um, and ask Emma, um, your relationship with Francisco was really different. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Um, yeah, so um, before I worked in the fall program for freshmen, and by the way, thank you, Rosalie, for helping us with that. Um, before I worked with the fall program for freshmen, I worked for the College of Letters and Science Office of Undergraduate Advising, and Francisco Santa Marina is one of the assistant directors. He's actually about to retire, but anybody who knows him um, personally or professionally would know that he is a great person to have as a contact or a mentor. Um, so the way that our mentorship relationship developed, and I do consider him one of my mentors, um, oh, that's exciting, um, is uh, I just, when I started my job there, um, I was in an administrative position, and we just had a lot of sort of small day-to-day -day interactions with each other, like checking in in the morning, um, something difficult came up at the front desk, and I needed a second opinion, just a lot of these little times that we got to collaborate at work, um, and through those interactions, it became clear that we not only had a personality fit, the way that um, Benet and Rosalie were discussing, we do have a personality fit, but also that we have similar approaches to difficult situations. We have similar values when it comes to our work. And he's in a very different point in his career than I am, but we were able to connect on a lot of different levels. So building off of that over time, um, I then was able to come to him when some tough situations came up and I needed a mentor at work and in my workplace. Um, I also have talked to him about like my personal career trajectory. He helped me when I was interviewing for my current job. So he's developed into more of a mentor figure, but for me it was much more organic and I didn't go in with an idea of what I wanted, but that just has developed kind of over time. So we wanted to present these two different ways that mentorship um, might develop in your own lives. Well, Emma, as we've been talking, you've been able to hear Rosalie's experience and reflect on your own and crystallize some of the commonalities that you thought were particularly powerful. Can you share those with us? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I sort of started to touch on that uh, just a minute ago, but um, some commonalities were um, both of these relationships were based on something that was pretty concrete. So either a particular goal or some specific daily collaboration that was happening, something that sort of like initiated the contact between these people that was a little bit, it was pretty concrete and tangible. You could kind of easily define it. Um, and then through working on that concrete goal, noticing commonalities, personality fit, shared interests, um, just noticing that you have a good fit with that person and you like working with them and you both have something to offer each other, that allows the relationship to develop. And a key piece of this that we're going to continue talking about is um, respecting and appreciating each other as people and building trust, um, not just thinking of each other as colleagues or just as your mentor or mentee, but really getting to know each other as individuals um, and building that relationship and the value that can bring. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Emma and Rosalie. <laughs> Oh, you're in actually, oh, yeah. let them talk Me. now. Sorry. <laughs> My <fault>. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so thank you for, um, you know, letting us present those case studies to you. Um, what I'd like everyone to do now is you have three handouts um, for this session. One of them is the reflect and discuss handout. And so that's a chance for you to, throughout this session um, and after the session is over, um, take some notes, anything that's jumping out at you. Um, we're gonna use it for our pair discussion that we're about to launch into. Um, and it's also a place for you to start to try to solidify if you have any goals around mentorship. So we'll use it throughout the session and you can hopefully continue to use it afterward to um, write down some of your thoughts. So um, right now, we are going to do our first pair discussion. So you can just turn to whoever is next to you. Um, first of all, briefly introduce yourself. Um, I know sometimes people say that it should be someone you don't already know. If you do know them, it's OK. Um, and I'd like you to discuss, oh, before we go. Sorry, guys. One second. Um, I'm going to give you about five to seven minutes or so to discuss with each other what motivates you to pursue mentorship opportunities, or alternatively, why did you choose this session, um, if that's easier to answer today. Um, and what challenges or barriers to creating mentorship relationships have you experienced in the past? So talk with your partner about that. If you'd like to jot down some notes in your pair discussion section on your handout, you can do that. Um, and then after about five to seven minutes or so, I'm going to ask some people to share out to the group what you guys discussed. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you all for having such what sounded to me like great conversations. I hope they were great for you as well. Um, and like I said, feel free um, to jot down any notes if you want to capture anything from what you discussed in your pair. Um, can I just hear from a couple of different groups? I know there are some trios and some pairs, but something that came up either um, that you shared or that one of the people in your group shared that you thought was particularly interesting, insightful. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Here, let me hand this off to you really quick so you can be properly recorded. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the things that seemed to be a problem uh, with mentoring is either finding the time, the energy, the availability. Um, I had instances where with a former mentee that I couldn't work with her because I was job transitioning and I was I left the job abruptly and I couldn't connect with her. Uh, and then also I had another mentee that was rather flaky in trying to nail them down uh, without me stalking them. So uh, it, it's a myriad of issues that would make one a lot um, hesitant to, to actually want to be a mentor. But for me personally, it's all of those things, but also to find subject matter and to find somebody you know, I have a particularly strong subset of what I'm good at. I don't think I can find anybody here uh, on on the surface, but uh, with the leadership, it's not impossible, and that could be easily found. So less so the technical stuff, but more so the personal stuff. Yeah, I think everyone's always concerned about either do I have the time or am I asking too much time or not enough time. So yeah, the issue of time is definitely something. Um, and we're going to talk as well a little bit about um, the importance of just checking in um, and being open about what's going on. Um, so that's one of our suggestions possibly for some of those logistical questions because it can be awkward from both sides if you feel like you're either asking too much or not giving enough. Um, so that's definitely something that um, has come up in our conversations with folks. So thank you for sharing that. Dave, right? Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found very powerful about doing the formal Berkeley Staff Assembly Mentorship Program is it's a little bit prestigious. You do apply for it, and I don't know if everyone who applies is accepted, but I at the point that I applied and got accepted, I told my supervisor and, and her supervisors that I had been accepted into this program and that I was planning on doing it and that those skills would add to my unit and develop kind of it, that would be a benefit to the whole unit. And that basically was me saying, I'm taking the time to do this and it's an important part of my work because it's going to help all of us. And I think that by kind of going through that process, it carved out the time and legitimacy for doing this professional development opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you, Rosalie. Other comments that came up during your discussion with your partner or trio? What motivates you for, to pursue mentorship? Can we hear some of that? Okay, great. So, Ye is is brand. She's a recent college grad. Has worked on campus a year, less than a year, and works in a lab. So she works for one other person. So her environment is very con contained, and so a mentorship program would be a great thing for her to be able to meet other people, both who are in a science role or perhaps not uh, to really expand her uh, point of view. So I'm advocating. <laughs> definitely, yeah, thank you so much. I think that's definitely a very um, common experience um, in a lot of workplaces and definitely on campus of just feeling like you're a little bit isolated in your unit and want to kind of expand out either within your field or to another field entirely to see kind of what else is out there. Okay, how about one more comment? I know it's the afternoon, thanks. Hi, thanks. I'm Jillian. I just wanted to also share something. Uh, I'm Jillian. I also just wanted to share something that um, my partner said that I thought was really um, insightful and terrific. Um, and she was talking about um, pursuing opportunities as a mentor um, and talking, framing it in terms of uh, the things that bring her joy uh, that she uh, wants to contribute and can contribute and how she can contribute. And um, I thought that was a wonderful um, uh, point of departure um, and further growth. So, yeah. 
Yeah, thinking about, okay, I'll get you in a sec. Yeah, thinking about what you might be able to offer to somebody else. And that I know for like myself and a lot of other people that brings a lot of job satisfaction if you feel like you're able to contribute something to others. So yeah, thinking about that and not being too modest about the strengths and skills that you might have. Yeah, last comment. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I think we all experience this in some way, is just getting over the fear of putting yourself out there, one, and two, of rejection, or of, you know, saying, I don't know how to do this, I don't know where to go with this, where I'm not aware of this resource, or just the vulnerability of um, saying, you know, and reaching out, extending yourself across the table. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's really important to keep as part of this conversation. I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up actually during the session, but we, as I kept talking about this, I kept comparing seeking mentorship kind of like online dating, <laughs> where like <laughs> you go on a lot of different dates, you're putting yourself out there, you're being vulnerable, you're trying to see like what's the right fit, um, and you might have some dates that like they're a great person, but it's not the right fit for you, and like that's okay. So anyway, yes. Thank you for bringing that up about the vulnerability piece and the, the fear that can come up with that because, yeah, it definitely is vulnerable to ask for help and also to offer help. So thank you. Great. All right. So um, we are going to move into a little bit more um, concrete sort of tips and tricks, a little bit of a model um, that you might use to think about the stages that you're at. So Benet is going to talk us through that part. So in terms of this model, um, every kind of in the middle is the whole idea of purpose, which gets to not only kind of why do I want a mentor, but why do I want to be a mentor? And it was really nice to hear the example in the back um, about kind of bringing the joy and stuff to that. Um, and, um, and that, as we've talked about, may also change over time. So it may be that the mentee changes goals like we talked about before. It may be that there's something different that the mentor starts getting out of the relationship, whether it's new information or knowledge, connection, their own learning. And so it's OK if this changes. Um, one of the things that came up is, as we've been talking is just that there's no, you don't fail mentoring. <laughs> um, and it's just something that, that happens. The starting out um, piece. Um, the how do I begin, I can really relate to what you were talking about, about that how do I just get over my fear and ask. And I remember um, working, starting to work closely with the university registrar at one point. She was many, many layers in the organization ahead of me, but there was something about her that I just was like, I want to have a conversation with her outside the office. And so I asked her to lunch, and she was the first person who modeled to me this whole notion of, um, well, let's have another lunch, you know, and it kind of it grew from one lunch to a handful of lunches that have been one of the most impactful kind of turning points for me. And all I had to do at that point was work up the courage to say, can we have a lunch? And she took it from there. I had somebody else who I asked to actually be a mentor, which was even a harder risk for me to do. Um, and one of the things that she did was really helpful was she was clear about what would work for her, that she could do it, but it would be we could meet on this up to this frequency. And that was really helpful because in the first situation, I held back asking to connect with her um, because I didn't know what frequency was OK with her. And I didn't have the skills at that point to, to ask the conversation what made sense. And so I held back more and probably could have gotten more out of it had I gotten over some of my fear or had she kind of said, here's something that might work for me. Um, it can also be joining a formal program, um, like we're talking about um, later. Getting going, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Berkeley Staff Assembly Mentorship Program is that there's a relationship contract that the mentees and the mentors do. And a piece of that is actually, what are your expectations of each other? Um, and it's really nice because you're you're getting to some of the what commitments are we making to each other in terms of frequency and time and what we expect from each other. Um, and I've shared some of your frustrations. Dave is a kind of mentor. And it's really hard to be on the mentoring side when somebody 
um, just kind of falls off or isn't following through and, and can understand that as well. So trying to be clear on those expectations. And sometimes the making progress is not just about the goals, but making progress on the relationship. Um, one of the other things the um, mentorship program encourages people to do is a mid-cycle evaluation. And so if you were in an informal situation, you could say, hey, we've been getting together now for three months, six months. Can we check in on how it's going? So it doesn't have to be on a formal timeline. But I found that as the kind of making progress to think about the relationship as well as the goals can be really helpful. Um, also trying to think about how to nurture the relationship um, and um, feedback with each other um, can be helpful. And then with the evolving piece, one of the things I don't think we often do enough on campus and sometimes in mentoring is celebrate. Um, so making sure that we're celebrating, and this is where kind of it, it might keep kind of going back and forth, but making sure that we're celebrating the accomplishments people are making and kind of their relationship as it's appropriate. And then this evolving part can also be about um, kind of deciding to bring closure to a relationship or to transition the relationship. So one of the things Rosalie and I are looking forward to is we would meet and, and talk about what was coming up for Rosalie and, and some of what it related stories like she mentioned, but we want to get to know each other better. So we're going to transition to friendship next. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to that. So that'll be great. So evolving doesn't necessarily have to be the end, but sometimes something just comes to a natural end. Whether it's somebody leaves campus, something comes up like a job transition. So it's also OK if it ends. Um, if you can do closures, closure, sometimes that's more meaningful. But even if you can't, there again, there's no kind of failing mentoring. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add um, that all of this is captured on um, your second handout, and there are some sort of prompting questions. So if you're at one of these different phases, and that's what I'm going to ask you to reflect on in a moment, but um, this can be really helpful. And I really, um, Benet developed these questions um, you know, through a source that she found and then through some of her own um, kind of reworking of it. And I think they're really great is as a concrete tool um, to really think about um, next steps, action items, re ways to reframe if you're feeling a little bit stuck. So I definitely recommend um, checking out these questions. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention really quickly is I know we've referenced the BSA mentorship program a lot so far in this presentation. And I just wanted to put out there that I know that there are certain classifications that are not able to participate in that program. Um, that's a whole story if you want to hear about that at another time. But if that's you and you're thinking like this doesn't apply to me because I can't do this program, a lot of the resources um, can be made available to you just like if you want to talk about the process, how the process works, if you want to see an example of like a mid-cycle check-in or something, um, definitely reach out to me and I'm happy to share that with all of you even if you can't participate in the exact role that you want to. So don't feel limited by that because um, I know that that can be a limiting factor for folks. Just wanted to put that out there. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that was a plug for the staff orgs on the communities of practice. Yes. Session last year was the difference between doing mentorship with somebody who's in kind of your line of supervision and somebody who's outside of your office. And sometimes you can really bring up different things depending upon um, who you're talking to. And so the, one of the things I like about the community of practice is maybe there's politics that are going on in your office that you don't necessarily want to talk to with somebody in your immediate office that it might be a different kind of space and allow for that. So I think that's another reason. And I hear the networking session was really popular this morning. So it's also a really great way to network. 
Yeah, thank you. All right, so we're going to move into our next um, discussion. So go ahead and stay with your same partner um, so you guys can kind of just continue where you left off, hopefully. Um, and what I'd like everyone to do is take a look at the mentoring relationship model handout. And there are these five phases on here. Um, so I'd like everyone to reflect on, um, first on your own, just reflect on what phase do you think you're at right now? Um, you may be at different phases with different relationships, but if that's the case, just pick one and reflect on that. Where are you at right now? Um, and what are some steps or action items that would help you move forward either to the next phase of the model or just forward in general with your mentoring goals? So I want everyone to take like five minutes or so to reflect on that um, yourself and jot some notes down and then um, I'm going to have you share with your partner or your group from earlier. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for, um, again, humoring us and participating in these discussions. Um, Benet and I were just saying that everyone seemed like uh, they were having such great conversations. We wanted to be able to hear all of what you were saying. Um, but can we just hear maybe um, a couple of examples of, um, was anyone able to identify, oh yeah, I feel like I'm at this stage of this mentoring relationship model and I'd like to move forward and here are some ways I could do that. Sorry, that's like a four part question. That's bad facilitating. Any part of that. <laughs> or anything that came up in general. Yes. Hi. I'm at How Do I Begin, and I'm just generating resources at this point in time. So BSA I'm going to check out, and um, the community communities of practice I'm also going to look into. Um, my colleague here does a lot of informational interviews and is very inspiring in her own right of going out there and kind of getting to know people. So I'm kind of, yeah. Again, just at the beginning part of identifying, and I was thinking about what you said, and I was just posing that question to Secret over here, um, of how did you know, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of going off right now, um, but how did you know when you kind of like interacted with the woman in the registrar's office, how did you know that that was the person, like what was it about her, what characteristics were you like identifying with that you were like, oh, you would be really great to go and have lunch with and see if there's like a connection. I guess that's kind of where I'm, my sticking point. Yeah of I'm not really sure of who to approach and what I'm looking for, per se. Yeah, yeah. We talked to a couple different stages about, like, the sort of, like, click that happens sometimes. Um, and again, as Benet mentioned earlier, um, it's not to say that every mentoring relationship has to have that strong, strong um, interpersonal, like, personality fit. You can definitely get a lot out of it in something that is not so deep as that. But a lot of us have experienced that sort of like click of like, oh yeah, like this is the person that I want to get to know. Um, so I think, yeah, just putting yourself out there in some of those ways and just meeting more people, um, it will help you kind of hopefully start to define like, okay, like this is the type of person that I really would like to approach. Yeah, I just want to add that to go back to your dating analogy, that it's not always love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> But in each case, there was, for me, in each case, there was some kind of spark. And sometimes it was just like my heart opened and I admired the person. And it's just like, wow, I just want to, I just want to have spend a little bit of time and see where this goes. Sometime one person who's been my mentor for a long time, Kathy, I love how her brain works. And so the intellectual curiosity side of me um, was really kind of engaged. And so it may not always be love at first sight, but just some part of me, whether it was in my body or my heart or my mind, said, ooh, I want to know more about that person. These are the wisdom bites Rosalie was referring to earlier. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just wondering, actually, it's obvious in the case of BSA mentorship program, it's formal, everybody's aware of it, you know, people sign up for right. being a mentor. Um, what kind of informal channels are there? I mean, if you just reach out to somebody and tell them, hey, you know, can you be my mentor? That might come off a little strange or, you know, are people, what is the awareness of? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. start with that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get yeah. an informal one? Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's some different ways it can um, develop. In my case, um, with the example I gave earlier with Francisco as my mentor, it did sort of just develop slowly organically over time but the other thing I thought about with that is that we had regular contact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis and he happened to be in my office so there was a lot of like luck and circumstance that went into that relationship being able to develop in that way um I think 
that one thing that helps me as thinking of it from the mentee side of like, how would I approach this person is if you're not comfortable, like when I mentioned earlier, doing a formal ask of like, I have identified you as a person on campus who I would like to get to know and like, please be my mentor and here are the goal, the six goals that I'd like to work with you. Like that's a lot, right? Um, but if it, it could be something as simple as like, hey, would you like to, you know, get coffee with me? I had this question that came up in my job and I think that maybe you might be a good resource for me. Can we talk about this? Something that's a little bit more manageable, not so formal as like, I would like you to be my formal mentor. That can be a little more approachable for you and for the other person. And then you can kind of see how that goes. That's like your first date. And like not every first date is perfect. And you can just see. And if it seems like a good fit, then you can interact with them again. And then maybe after you've met a couple of times, um, then maybe do more of a formal ask of like, hey, I really have these goals. I feel like you'd be a great person to work with. Um, you know, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, is there a one thing that came up when uh, we were discussing this, say that do they are interested in uh, being a mentor and all that, um, how do they formalize that on their time card, if you would? <laughs> you know, how do they officially uh, set aside some time to be your mentor? Is that acceptable, like in our current systems? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. All of us are supposed to have like 5% of our jobs or something, so many five day kind of a spread over time. There is some campus support, and I know it varies by supervisor for the whole idea of professional development. And I know our current um, associate interim associate vice chancellor for human resources really values mentoring. And so I think there's support from the top for this, um, even though it, it might not always at a supervisor level be supported as much. But so I think there is campus support for it. Um, I just, the other thing I want to add is I actually did have somebody ask me. We went straight from the having a first date to she actually asked me at lunch if I'd be her mentor. And just to say that was okay too. So if that's your style and you're more of a upfront, I don't want to beat around the bush, <laughs> you know, that's who I am, that that's okay too. And you can get it a positive result. You might also get a no, but in our case it worked out. So. Um, I just want to make permission for, there's a variety of ways to be in this, and it's about, I think, finding your own internal, your own authentic kind of voice and style in it. And take risks is one of the things that I would say. And um, if you, to, one of the nice things is having a mentor doesn't show up in your performance evaluation, like the, what you talk about and kind of the steps you take isn't something you get rated on. So in some ways, for me, it's a safer way to take risks um, to try new things. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of what um, came up for us as we were developing this session was just finding ways to be your authentic self so that you can bring authenticity to these relationships. So if it's not your style to be super upfront and be like, hi, I have these this whole outline of goals and let's work on that, then that's not going to be a good fit for you as an approach. But if that's the way that you operate, then you can see who's a good fit for you. And if they like that style, that's also a good ind indication that you guys might work well together. Um, so I know that was just uh, only a little bit of sharing out. Um, I know there were a lot of other great conversations that were happening, but I think that this actually segues well into talking about our tips. So, Benet, would you like to talk about that? Sure. So in your handout, there is tips for um, mentors and mentees. We're going to focus on one in particular and let you read the rest. Um, what we really wanted to focus on is the authentic conversations piece. Um, the one of the things that came across in our interviews in particular and in the literature was fostering mutual respect and trust. And I just want to recap some of the tangible ways talking with Francisco and Emma was really great and hearing the I loved that part of it started because they were fellow grammar travelers. So when you go back to this whole notion notion of like what's that spark, what connects you, it may not even be work related. Um, that's the starting place. But they had a series of interactions over time, whether it was around grammar or around work, and they were kind of able to build on that. Um, they talked about how it went further um, when they were able to do something like work on a project together. So this is where, again, the communities of practice or being on an ad hoc work group or a committee with somebody where you're getting to kind of get to know them a little bit during the work. And that's how I had made the connection with the registrar was through a, a committee that I was staffing. And then um, 
that combination of the interactions through the project or committee work combined with the conversation outside really enhanced. Um, I really liked how Francisco talked about um, creating goodwill in the relationship. So when you need to have the hard conversations, um, that you've already got some goodwill there. And I thought that was really, he had a lot of wisdom bites I found um, through the conversation. Um, and that sometimes the experience of, of the other person having your back, um, whether it was around a challenge, you, something you were challenging or an obstacle or something can kind of deepen the relationship and, and continue to build trust. Um, one of the things as a mentor that I try and do is come from a place of humility and continuous learning. I mean, I, I, the mentees that I've all worked with are in a learning place, but I feel like as a mentor, it's more successful if I'm really coming from a place of learning as well. Um, Rosalie talked about how part of what started because of our similarities and for me, I also thinking of being an ally in, and how to bring that into our mentoring relationship and to be able to kind of understand and recognize when there are differences as well and to be able to hold the similarities and the differences. Um, we've already, t we've talked in a couple different ways today about taking risks and being vulnerable. And the thing that, again, was just so fun talking to Emma and Francisco was the sense of humor and playfulness um, that they brought to the conversation and their relationship. And Rosalie and I have had a lot of fun too. So for some people, they want to be really serious about their mentoring, and that's totally OK. Um, I had one mentee who was just very serious, and she had her goals for each time we met, and, and that was OK. But it's also really fun when you bring your sense of humor to the mix as well. So we wanted to encourage that human side too. All right, um, so I hope that you all will continue to reflect on these tips and on your personal goals. And please, if you do have questions or if you'd like to know more about the BSA Mentorship Program, you can definitely um, get in touch with either one of us. And I just wanted to sort of close by thinking about um, Hopefully you can reflect on some of the examples that we provided today. Um, I don't think when you're getting advice from other people, I don't think it's ever um, the case that you should take exactly what someone else did and replicate that completely in your own life. That usually doesn't work. But just being able to hear a variety of perspectives and sort of take what's helpful for you from those different perspectives and examples of how this might work for you. Um, hopefully you've be, been able to pull out a couple of um, nuggets for yourself that might be helpful. Um, and you may not get to this today or this week or whenever, um, but on the handout we've been working with um, to take notes and reflect on the discussions, um, there's also a section for you to actually write down a goal that you have. And um, sort of similar to what Rosalie was saying about how the importance of the experience was sort of um, highlighted when she let her supervisors know, this is what I'm doing, this is how I'm gonna spend my time. Like some way of formalizing that for yourself can be helpful in like moving you forward in terms of thinking about, okay, I'm really gonna do this. Like I really am gonna go do these informational interviews even though that sounds terrifying and like a lot of work <laughs> um, or whatever it is. So if you have the chance to write down a concrete goal for yourself, um, you can borrow one of the suggestions from the mentorship model handout or whatever works for you. Um, but I really hope that you all can can just actually take something from here and apply it to your life and your work. Um, and that's our goal for you from this session. Um, so yeah. So I wanted to, um, there's a lot of wisdom in the room and kind of, I appreciate kind of your wrap up, but I also think we might have a couple minutes for a little more Q&A and or asking questions of each other. So don't feel like you can just ask the three of us questions. If you want to pose something to the group and get a variety of perspectives, we can do as well. And I saw Rosalie had something she wanted to say. Yeah, we technically have almost 10 minutes because we do have time. <laughs> just, I really appreciate Emma and Benet including me in this, this session for a, a mentee perspective. But one thing I want to mention, I think responding to the idea about like, is it okay to ask people to be your mentor? Um, we work in a university setting, 
which means two things. One is that it's public service. We're a public university. And I really see participating as a mentor. And in my job, I'm so grateful that I get to mentor a lot of students. And I invite every single one of my students as they're graduating and moving on or no longer work with me to have like a kind of exit conversation around, hey, just let's talk about anything that will help you kind of think and develop. And I feel like as that's part of our like public service mission as a university. And, there's n and I feel like we do that with each other so much. I've never had someone say no to me on campus when I've asked to have lunch with them. or, And I'm pretty shy and don't do that a lot. But every time I have, it's been incredibly meaningful. And I think that as staff, sometimes we forget that we get to participate in the educational offerings of this university. Like faculty and students have a very formal like idea about education, but we get to educate ourselves too. It's one of the wonderful things about working in a university setting, and so we are resources for each other in our co-education. Thank you so much for that. And are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, let me bring this to you. <laughs> I just have a burning question. You have talked about how to get into the mentorship program, mm -hmm. but if at any stage you find that it's not working, is there like, the best practice of how to get out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you committed? Do they lock the door? Um, yeah, so the question was about the, the BSA mentorship program specifically, right? Is that what you were talking about? Any kind of mentorship. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the situation, right? If you're having a check-in and you're like, oh, this really isn't meeting you know, my goals or it's not the right fit for me right now, um, you definitely can have a conversation about that. But do you have any specifics from your experience with this? That you have to share? Well, I mean, I do have one where I'll admit it just kind of fell off, you know? And so there's the, there's the whole continuum from it just kind of falling off. And this is one where I will admit I was the mentee and that kind of thing and just kind of didn't follow through. Um, and so I lost out on the experience. I think there's a whole continuum to then being kind of really honest about what's not working and that it's and wanting to bring closure to it. And sometimes you have the relationship and sometimes the whole issue is that the relationship isn't there and that's not. And so sometimes you may just need to find some other way to express, for me, I might have to find another way to express that either something isn't working or something new is taking more precedence and I need to shift my focus. So I would find different language probably depending upon, now I would try to bring some closure to it, but I just wanna recognize that sometimes it's more psychologically safe than other times to actually have that conversation. As well. So um, I mentioned earlier that I did participate in the BSA mentorship program, and actually now there's a requirement that you need to have been on campus for at least a year in order to participate as a mentee, and at the time that I did, that wasn't a requirement, so I was very, very new to campus when I participated, and I didn't have a clear goal in mind. I was like the opposite of Rosalie. I was like, I just want to learn more about Berkeley, like very broad, um, and it turned out that my mentor, um, we get along really well. We have really great conversations, um, but at a certain point, my goals did solicit. Solidify, and so it wasn't the best fit in terms of working towards my very specific goals that I ended up having by the end of the cycle. So in my case it, as well, it sort of did, the meaningfulness did kind of trickle off a little bit and we still kept meeting and we still got along and he was still able to share a lot of great perspectives from his breadth of his time of working at Berkeley because he's been here for many, many years. So that was still really great for me to know. Um, but it did become a little bit... Um, less focused um, and I was like kind of embarrassed about that for a while and like oh I feel like I should have handled that better or something but we've mentioned before that we believe and I believe now that there's no such thing as failing mentorship like it's just it can just shift it can just be different than you thought um, so the fear of not being able to achieve what you set out to do um, if possible I hope that um, you can try to not let that stop you from trying um, and now oftentimes when I run into him on campus, we have great chats, you know, like it's like, it worked out fine. He still talks to me, <laughs> even though I didn't do like the best job of being a mentee for the last three months. You know what I mean? So yeah. Other comments, thoughts? Great. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that you, oh, 
Sorry, Link. <laughs> so you mentioned that you went into the mentorship program sort of not having a clear goal in mind. Um, and I feel like I'm a little bit in that spot. Um, I just, yeah, I'm sort of wondering how you approach that with your mentor, because sometimes I think, you know, you're going in to meet with someone, you ask them to lunch, et cetera, et cetera. And how do you sort of navigate that when you may not have a really clear goal in mind, um, at least at the beginning? Yeah, well, um, I'm a person who likes to understand, like, bigger picture systems and kind of how everything relates, like, different parts relating to a whole. And so my broad goal going in was to just understand the structure of UC Berkeley better, which I thought I could do that in a year-long mentorship program. I've been on campus longer, and now I know that's not reasonable. <laughs> but <laughs> just getting a sense of kind of, like, you know, where things are at. He'd been on campus for a long time. He was on the Chancellor's Staff Advisory Committee, so a lot of experience um, in terms of just the workings of the university. So that was where we started, um, and it was helpful. Um, but because our uh, he worked in a very different area on campus for me, so when my goals became more specific to, like, particular job postings or particular advancement, it wasn't as um, relevant because he's in a very different pl place for me career-wise with that. So, um, yeah, I wasn't, like, the most forthright about when I started to observe that, and that probably would have helped if I had been. Um, but I, we did start out with just sort of, like, a general um, goal, and we just kind of had chats, and it was very unstructured. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, friend. Um, so I'll just chime in from the, in terms of the BSA mentorship, that structured program, um, I'm on the committee, so I'm, um, so part of the process of applying to participate is doing this informational interview process and sort of comparing notes because there are mentees and mentors that match very closely in terms of wanting a real structure. The mentor is going to make, give assignments and, um, you know, there will be a really sort of point by point process. Um, and there are mentees who want that. And then there are the opposite on the spectrum where both sides are just like, let's get to know each other and see how we can connect and talk. And so there's a, there's a broad range. So even if you know, right now you're like, I'm not totally sure where I am in this process. Um, there are, uh, you know, we try to recruit twice as many mentors as we have mentees. So there's a broad range of people to choose from. And there are lots of mentors who are super happy to just be on the journey with you. And, and maybe that will evolve in, and you'll have maybe a similar experience to Emma's or um, something else. So, so you don't have to feel like you need to have this 12 point outline um, when you're starting. So One of the situations I was just reflecting on is um, I had with one of my BSA mentees a really precious experience where it wasn't about, she actually didn't have a goal. She just said we had worked on a committee together, hadn't seen each other in a long time, but when she joined the mentorship program and was looking at the CVs and thought of what she wanted, I had just been in campus spaces that she wanted to hear more about. And actually what ended up shifting to is just every time she brought, this is what I'm you know, thinking about, and we just had an authentic conversation. Um, you know, so there was no, no prepping that either of us really kind of did, but it was just we committed to showing up and having conversations. Where I've had somebody else who was very goal-oriented, who we kind of, she set me ahead of time, you know, three to five things she wanted to learn about project management or whatever, and, and I'd say, well, I can, we can do this, and then we'd have a more kind of formal learning together type of situation. But sometimes it's OK to just want to have some conversation with somebody. And that's enough for it to feel meaningful to a mentor, too. It was very precious, that time I had with Sky. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that's also nice to know if this is going to be your first time kind of venturing out to do this, um, especially if you're doing it on your own, not through a formal program, to not put too much pressure on it if that feels um, prohibitive. <laughs> yes. Did you have one last question? So the formal BSA mentorship program, you can only, as a mentee, you can only do it once. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on? Um, well, as you've heard, Vinay has served as a mentor many times, and some of our other mentors have as well. And because of the issues of time and availability that were brought up earlier, um, we want to make sure that we're able to provide this experience for the most people possible. So that's why there is that limitation. Um, but like I said, you know, you can also use the tools from that model to kind of 
form your own um, network or, you know, if you're looking for people in a certain area and you know somebody has participated in BSA in the past, that might be an indication that they're open to being a mentor for you as well. So there are other ways to kind of um, navigate within that structure if you've already participated and you're not able to participate again as a mentee, um, or you can become a mentor if your classification allows now. So um, yeah, it, it is that is true and that is a good point. Yeah, yeah, great. I think that we are at the end of our time. Thank you all so much for participating and staying till the bitter end of the last session. Yes. Please fill out your session evaluations, um, and you can hand them to our wonderful, lovely volunteers over there, um, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much.